Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. I love how people to this day can still debate who killed who and you know, who was on the phone and, and such. I mean, I'm not sure that there's a ton of like, I, th I think by now people are fairly sure who exactly it is, but the the fact, excuse me, that it's, you know, you can't, you know, it's hard to be entirely sure, yeah, and I mean, the, supposedly, when Casey was, you know, stalked and murdered, supposedly Stu was with Tatum, so, yeah, it's, yeah, I really love how, you know, right after the, the opening, which I will get into detail on, right after, we see another young woman who also seems kind of innocent, and she seems to be by herself, and you hear a noise from outside, and it's like, you know, to us, watch out, Sydney, that's the killer. And ironically, it does turn out to be, so it's it's real great subversion. You know, you're saying that, no, oh, it's a killer, and then you see, oh, phew, just the boyfriend, and uh, yeah. The... The rules are broken several times. You know, you, Sid survives in spite of giving up her virginity, and you know, and and really, you know, not only does she not get killed because she has sex, you know, so there there is an argument to be made: is this? you know, this sort of sin must be punished kind of thing, you know, from, from an old, not necessarily Old Testament, but old-fashioned moral perspective. Is it sin? I don't remember exactly who, but I'm almost certain it was one of the, one of the guys who worked very closely on the, one of the Friday the 13th movies, and he pointed out we didn't really, at least consciously, and that's, of course, another, um, did they, was it conscious, was it just, you know, you know, you don't necessarily think about, but, you know, if you go far enough back, if you have sex with a lot of different people, there's a chance that you'll maybe get a disease from one of them, or if you already have a disease, you'll spread it to all of those, and, you know, today, that's not, it doesn't have to be a problem, it shouldn't be a problem, but, you know. Thank you, Bristol Palin. You know. And... Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, I, I want to say, is also doing that... I, I don't... I don't really offhand have a real problem with, like, you know, lovey-dovey you know, bubblegum pop music, but yeah, someone who does that, you know, you might say, you know, oh, she doesn't know any better. She has no excuse for not knowing any better. You know, this is the age of the internet. You know, once you've, you know, gone beyond the the trolls and the, the you know, the horny guys flashing, there's actually substantial amount of information on there. Anyway, the, the, you know, this producer 
I want to say, of Friday the 13th, some of the movies, said that it was really more that the characters who had sex weren't paying attention to their surroundings as much, and they weren't moving around enough, and they were by themselves, you know, just the two people. You know, that's how old-fashioned they were. So, yeah, you know, the, the killer had an easy time of finding them and killing them without, so, yeah. And, yeah, you know, you could have that argument. Is it is it in actuality that, that it's about? But not only did Sydney have sex, so by all rights, and, you know, we, we when we then see the killer coming, you know, at this point we're like, well, she's gonna die. There's There's no virgin girl remaining, you know, smart virgin girl surviving until the very end, who then, you know, so you're sitting there all the while, you know, the, the moment that she's done that, and especially when you then see the killer in the room, it's like, is she actually going to die? Because, you know, if you've watched a number of slasher movies, you probably come to expect that the smart virgin girl is the one who survives until the very end and you know maybe she doesn't necessarily defeat the the killer but she maybe stops him until the sequel you know whatever or or at least gets away alive but in this one you know she just and i love how it cuts from the the crew, you know, the, the group watching a movie, and they're like, okay, this is, you know, we're gonna get, get bare breasts, and then it cuts to Sydney, to, you know, it's, it's the movie, you know, yeah, it's, it's one of the most ironic points in the film, you know, the movie is literally, and, and right after we've seen Jamie Kennedy lie there and say, behind you, Jamie, you know he's around, you know, and to be fair, Randy doesn't actually know that the killer's at the party yet, you know, so, but, but yeah, you know, and he's, he's super drunk, so he's like, you know, half, and you know, look, look behind you, and it's just spot on, and just, yeah, such, such clever, you know, it's almost like they cast him for that, but I, I don't know exactly when the idea came to them, but yeah, it's it's just super clever. And that is, yeah, that's that's how a lot of us end up watching slasher movies, you know, yelling at the screen, no, 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 just, you know, be careful, and, you know, yelling directions at them. You know, not we, we've just seen that, and then... Kenny and I believe also Sid at that point, you know, are in the van, and then they see the the you know the killer behind, and then they actually talk to the so it's it's you know you've got you know we the audience is probably sitting there going no no, no behind you Jamie Kennedy is, and so is Kenny and Sid. So it's all of these, and it's this thing of when when Jamie Kennedy's doing it, it's like you know ah, how isn't why isn't he smart enough to down it? That's because he's drunk. You know he's like clearly <laughs> yeah he's not thinking because he he knows the rules he understands, but he's. Yeah, right now he's he's too drunk and he's just he's into the movie. So, you know, but then you have Kenny and Sid looking at a screen. And instead of running out and try, you know, I mean, you could say maybe they're scared, but instead of doing anything, even though they're in, you know, the the reality that we are in Scream is just a movie, and we're, you know, yelling in a movie. And on some level, we do realize, no matter how passionate we might be about it, we can't actually affect it. It's a movie. And then you have Jamie Kennedy. He's in there. He's watching a movie. He knows how this movie goes. So he's also just, he's engaging in the same thing. But at the same time, there is someone behind him. 
But then Kenny and Sid, they have no excuse. They're literally looking at something that's happening and not intervening, but instead yelling. And it's this just, yeah, it's, I love it, but I can totally understand why some people think it's just, it's too thick. It's too ironic. And, yeah, the, the, you know, other rules are, you know, maybe, you know, broken or, you know, Gail says, you know, she'll be right back and she survives, you know, you have, you know, Casey dying at the very start and, you know, we, we're not like entirely sure, like I already mentioned a little bit, you know, when we hear a noise, you know, when we're seeing Sid, it's like, that must be the killer. We've just seen, you know, we know that the killer left because he wasn't seen. We've just seen somebody die at the hands of the killer and then the killer is gone. And it's, it's clearly the same night. So it's like he's, he's moved on to this next victim. And so we're sitting there because we've just seen the character who might be, I mean, when you first watch it, you know, she says she doesn't have a boyfriend and, you know, she's a little flirty with him. You know, I'm, I'm not passing any judgment, but anyway, it's clever writing because you're like, she might be a virgin, she might be the one who survives until the end, you know, and I, I wish I could remember for sure about, you know, I mean, today, especially in slash movies, there is the opening kill. You know, we expect the first person we see to die in some way. But I I want to say that that wasn't really the case. That wasn't fully expected back then, but I'm not 100% sure. I think that is something that Scream then, you know, kind of introduced that we then start seeing someone die at the very start. But yeah, this is a character who you might think would survive. You know, she's she's smart, she might be a virgin, and she she realizes there's a killer. Again, most of the time, if you haven't seen the killer yet, or if you're not sure that there's a killer yet, then, you know, I mean, if, if you don't yet have, like, a POV or, you know, music that really sets up. It, it looks like just, I mean, yeah, she's alone, but at first it looks fine. It looks, it looks safe. It's so, yeah, when she dies, it's like, did they just, did they just kill the smart virgin girl who's supposed to survive until the end? And then we meet another one. And it's like, is she gonna die too? You know, so so when you then hear the sound and then it's just, you know, just the boyfriend, it's like, oh, okay. And then the the day after, you know, you're you're maybe thinking, is this just gonna be a spree? Is he gonna kill one person after another? I mean, by then, we've just seen that the the parents found Casey. So at least one body has been found by someone who's still alive. So some people are aware of the killer, but Sid isn't yet. Does that mean she's going to die before she, so yeah. You know, other, you know, rule kind of would Stu have died if he wasn't drinking, if he didn't say, I'll be right back. You know, I mean, sure, he's one of the killers, but the killer doesn't always die at the end of the slash movie. So, yeah, it's... I have the greatest respect for issues surrounding mental illness and I hate how the issue of, you know, the, the broad spectrum of mental illness is just used as an excuse. You know, just, you know, if, if something really horrible happened, oh, they, they must have been mentally ill or, you know, yeah, people, people expect them to be dangerous or yeah, they have all these negative stereotypes. With that said, I do really love the, the you know, the two psychos in this. Just, it's, it, 
when you see Stu and Billy, and you 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 know, once you realize that they're you know, you've you've just seen you know, you've got Randy and Stu outside, and then she locks the door, and then Billy comes in. It looked like he died though, and then you know, and she she locked them both in the room, and so you know, what would the so yeah, you know, he comes down. Okay, I I you know, oh yeah, he just. You know, he didn't, I, I don't remember what exactly he says, but yeah, something like, you know, he didn't hit any major organs or, you know, it, it looks worse than, you know, something. And then he goes, you know, to the door and, you know, l you know, lets in Randy, you know, he's got the gun and he's gone mad. We all go a little mad sometimes and he shoots, you know, and then it's like, what just happened? You know, he, he was... But he can't be the killer, because the killer just attacked him. But he can't be alive, because I saw him die, I thought. How could he have survived? Okay, so so he's the killer somehow. Okay, Stu, he got in from another door, whatever. Stu, you gotta help me. He's, you know, he's the killer. Surprise, Sydney. You know, just perfect. And it's... Just, yeah, you, you know, in a million years, you did not expect there to be two killers. You know, and, and it kept going back and forth. You know, how could Billy be the killer? You know, there's, there's the phone call from, from jail. There's the, the phone records. You know, all these different, just, yeah, and... And then you realize that Stu is also, you know, and just right before that, you know, when you see Stu and Randy walking up, and, and they're both saying, they're both looking like they've just been attacked. And they're like, he's the killer. And really, when, when you get right down to it, I mean, it's possible that Stu just attacked Randy, managed to unmask him, Stu said, you know, okay, I'm probably safer if I look like myself. And then, you know, just pretended to walk, you know, injured up there. So that Randy saying, no, 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 seriously, he's going to, you know, when he comes in, he says he's gone mad. So for serious, he might actually have just been attacked by, you know, hey, maybe he didn't even bother with the mask. You know, they certainly don't there at the very end. But yeah, it's, it's just so surprising and just yeah you know they they start stabbing each other and it starts out as this really disturbing sequence but then it gets really comical you know when when I mean you know at first it's just like okay go ahead stab me you know goes Billy and Stu stabs him and Billy's like okay and he gets the knife and then he stabs back you know and it's like you know, you, you can tell. Okay, that really hurt. And and he's like, he's he's looking for payback. So he's like, okay, that really hurt. You know, and it's like, you know, and, and he stabs and stabs. And Sid is just looking on horrified. Like, what is even, you know, it's like, not only did, you know, I mentioned in the review, it's it's just one twist and surprise after another, they're at the very end. You know, you've just realized, okay, okay, there are two killers. Then you find out they're sure they won't be caught because they're gonna frame someone. And then it's, yeah, you know, they they start stabbing each other, and it's just, yeah, it's it's so just. Yeah, dis disturbing and and you're know, comical, you know. And, and Stu has been stabbed like a ton of times, and he's like, "I think you you stabbed me too much, Happy. I'm not feeling well." And just yeah, and just, you know, I I love manic Stu, and on both sides of you know, what does that sound like a you know recipe for for like fast food or something anyway 
you know, I love him both before and after we find out that he is one of the killers. You know, he's... Uh, Houston, we have a problem. She looked dead. Still does. <laughs> and the, the... Yeah, you know, when he says, you know, oh, you know, he's they, they're standing there explaining to Sid, and, you know, Billy is like, Billy just finished off, you know, his part, the first part there of the monologue. And so, you know, he's expecting Stu to walk off, and then he kind of motions to him, oh, right, this next part, you're going to love it. It's going to be a scream, I'll be right back, you know, just, and I love when the rules are stated, and he says that right after. And I love how not only does Randy have a a bottle of beer in his hand when he's saying, you cannot get drunk. Right after, you know, they're, they're like, you know, going cheers to each other. And then someone offers up, you know, theirs to his, and he does, you know, so it's, and the, I suppose that's more or less it for the Manning story. But yeah, also, you know, okay, keep, keep her on the phone. Did you really call the cops? Oh, yeah. My mom and dad are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> you know, it's peer pressure. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really weak. It's, yeah. Now, the... I quite like also the, you know, the, the subversion of Billy being a killer. You know, I already mentioned, you know, he shows up when we're thinking killer, and then it's like, oh, I guess he innocent, or is he? You have him, you know, going in through the, the window, much like Glenn in Nightmare on Elm Street, played by... I can't believe I forget his one of my favorite actors, but the demon barber of anyway, yeah, you know Tim Burton's always working with him, and actually, you know Cotton looks somewhat like you know both of them as well. So it's like is you know she's. Does she just always think killer when she sees someone looking like that, or, you know, is she? And and there's that thing of supposedly Maureen willingly had sex with Cotton, so it's like, did did Sid see? You know, she did she realize that the two of them had sex, and then he sees you know Cotton, and it's like you know, dangerous to have sex with someone who looks like that, because then her mother was murdered. But, yeah, you know, the the two very much look alike, the three, and, yeah, both Glenn and Billy going through the window to the smart, innocent, lead virgin girl, and clearly both of them do want sex. You know, I'm Glenn maybe didn't say so much as, but, you know, I mean, he he's in his girlfriend's bedroom, and, you know, it's only the two of them who know it's, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's, you know, it's not even brain surgery, which we've recently learned is perhaps not as difficult as we've been led to believe. You know, and, yeah. And and then after that, Billy does turn out to be the killer when, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give away Nightmare on Elm Street, but, you know, you do already know Glenn isn't the killer. Freddy Krueger is. And, you know, it's possible that Glenn... Billy, rather, framed himself 
to guilt trip Sid into sex, you know, as a sort of, you know, so you'd rather say that I'm a psycho than, you know, and there's the element that it's payback for Maureen supposedly, may, you know, having sex with Billy's father, supposedly driving the mother away. So it's this thing, you know, your mother had sex with my father, so I killed your mother, and then you have sex with me, so I'm going to kill you. As, as this sort of, you know, like, like father, like son kind of thing, you know, he already killed the, the mother who was, you know, and, and there is the, you know, again, it plays with conventions, so it comments on once a girl has lost her virginity, is she then not going to survive the slasher? Even if she has sex with her boyfriend, even if it's near the end of the film. And, yeah, and, and the thing of, you know, the, the relationship between, if, the ver if, if a woman in a slasher has sex, then the killer is going to kill her. And Sid not only has sex in a slasher, but with one of the killers. So, you know, I guess he's especially going to kill... You know, it's it's really playing with the... A lot of the killers in the slashers are not exactly the people that... You know, the, these are not men that women are, like, fawning over and really want to have sex with, but... Nevertheless, you know, they're, they, they're not always these, you know, real, like, I mean, they're, they tend to be monsters, but they're not all literal monsters. Some, some of them are just human beings and perfectly, you know, so, yeah. I love how the Fonz yells at these boys for you know, their generation, you know, he, th this was the guy who, to a bunch of white people, you know, I, I guess a generation ago, or a previous generation to the generation of kids in this, I suppose it's another new generation, I don't know. Anyway, I mean, anyway, yeah, you know, he was the, the icon to the generation before it, so it's this, yeah, it's, it's again super ironic, and then, you know, he Fonzies into the, the, the mirror, you know, it's, yeah. It's been proposed that with Stu, it's scarier if we don't know the motive, and the motive, and really it's the, you know, the, the film itself brings it up, you know, it's the millennium, it, you know, they're, they're incidental, but it's, you know, with, with Billy, we do know, and, you know, there, it is, it is the very familiar, for the subgenre, motive of revenge, but here, you know, it goes beyond that, it's, you know, they're, they're staging it, which is, of course, again, you know, this, this, like I said in the review, it, the, the film exists, the, the reality presented in the film is somewhere between actual reality and a slasher film's reality, so in the slasher, the, you know, these high schoolers who are usually you know, the, the targets of the killer have targeted other high schoolers as killers and they are they are staging their own slasher. And, you know, they even mention I love that I, I think only two people, only two characters in this really mention the sequel and both of them end up dead and obviously thus not in the sequel. You know, you know, these days, you know, Tatum says, I want, don't kill me, I want to be in the sequel. And Stu says, we're, you know, we, we will be planning the sequel. And clearly, you know, 
he and Billy will be planning the sequel, but neither of them survive the film, so they can't. It's it's really, really clever. Which, again, when you, you know, I mean, with, with Tatum, you're maybe, you know, really thinking, like, no, get, you know, take him seriously, get away. But, you know, she does take him seriously the moment that he shows that he has a knife. You know, before that... Yeah, you know, there's been so many pranks recently, and he doesn't, he hasn't done anything to attack her yet, but anyway, yeah, the, and, and really, that whole setup is just great, you know, the, the door closes and locks, you know, door closes mysteriously, and then it locks, you know, and then it's like, well, okay, you know, when she came in, she tried to turn on the light, but accidentally also activated the garage door opener, you know, yeah, accidentally had the garage door open so when she turns that off it closes again so it's like okay if you know if I can't go through the door I'll just open you know and right before that we see you know jump scare cat get you know which again it's it's not played as like a huge a real jump scare it's just it's kind of poking fun at the jump scare cat the jump scare you know, that doesn't mean anything. But the cat, you know, and that's also, the cat really has a point, because what does the cat do? It runs out through the, the you know, the pet door. I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but yeah. So it's like, okay, we've, we've just had established that the door is locked, there's a, you know, pet, oh, you know, pet door, and the, the garage door itself can be opened by the switch. So she switches it on, goes over there, and then it stops. And she's like, well, I mean, I could go on, you know, it's like ugh, electrical, you can't depend on it. But I could just go on, nope. And she turns around and the killer made it, yeah. And so, you know, she ends up trying to crawl through and you know I know some people make fun of that I understand why I you know I would say you know if she's panicked and she doesn't think that she you know where else is she gonna go does she really you know what is she gonna do run up to the door switch on the the garage door somehow keep him away from the garage door until it opens enough that she can go out you know I mean I mean I guess she could pull a what is it, Raiders of the Lost Ark and roll out under, you know, she can maybe think of that, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's the, you know, do all of that and then get out, all the while without him killing her, I just, I, I don't see it, besides which, do know that in actuality, Rose McGowan was, you know, able to fit through, they, they had to like, what was it, like somehow attach her to the door so that it could so that she could struggle without actually getting through but anyway and it's also it's the most creative kill of the film now yeah the the you know yeah when she says you know I want to be in the sequel it's also this thing of has she done anything that could get you know, I mean, she might, she might live. This is not the first time we've seen a major female character be attacked and live. You know, I mean, Sid has survived every single attack. I mean, sure, this would be the first, it would be the first time a woman was attacked, but not actually killed by the killer. But then... When we first see, when we first see Drew Barrymore, we're like, she's not gonna die. So, and and then when we see Sid, it's like, she's gonna die too. Is is she gonna die? So when we see Tatum there, it's like, might she? You know, we're we're like, we don't know which one to expect. And it looks like she might be able to get out of the the pet door. You know, Sid has escaped through, you know, stuff like that, so, yeah, but the, yeah, those, you know, those are the people talking about the sequel, and, 
yeah, the, this thing of staging, you know, they're, they're not even only saying, you know, we want to, you know, make our own lives a slash movie. They are trying to, you know, the, the revenge thing, if they had managed to do it, you know, it basically makes sense. You know, the, the slasher killer is often, you know, it's very rare for it to be one of the high schoolers, one of the young people that are attacked. It usually is someone older and, so, you know, and we don't, we don't know exactly what's going on. You know, the father never did check in, so maybe he's been running around killing people. And, you know, with all this talk, you know, the, the sheriff said, you know, it's like, could one of these teens really have done it? I don't know. Not before, but, ugh, you know, today with these kids. And the, the principal is also like, you kids, I hate your entire generation. You know, which also makes us, you know, I, I guess we never really suspect the sheriff maybe, but, you know, we do maybe think, could it be, you know, I, could it be the principal? I love the sound work on the scissors, you know. No, you're right, it's not fair. Fair would be, and he, you know, acts it out with the scissors right up against the, the you know, the student's chest. I mean, through, through the shirt, but still, you know, we hear the... You know, it sounds like this is the sharpest freaking thing in the universe. It sounds like the thing could cut through steel. It's it's insane. I absolutely love it. And yeah, the the so so yeah, you know, maybe it is an older person who really hates this generation because that is, you know, an older person who you know maybe he doesn't have a motive or maybe he hates younger people you know, for various reasons. So, yeah, it's it's this... It makes sense, you know, right up until, you know, it turns out that the two of them are the killers, you maybe do think, it, I mean, it could be, you know, they, the, you know, Dewey and Gale just found the car. So, I mean, it must be him, right? I mean, he could have done it and hid, you know, remain hidden. They even, you know, the cell phone. It it must you know, the the issue is brought up, you know, could they have cloned yeah, it's it's possible. We don't know entirely. But it is, you know, it has been tracked to his phone. So just and since he didn't check in at the Hilton, does he have anything resembling an alibi? So it's uh, yeah. And, the, and and also, I mean, we only see him very briefly, and he seems like a loving parent. But there is just this little thing, you know, it's not like super Hallmark card loving parent. You, you get the, you know, super Hallmark card loving parents would be Casey's parents, you know. So it's not that the movie doesn't know how to make someone look like just complete cookie cutter perfect parents. You know, but with him, there's like... I could have sworn I heard a noise, you know, and like she said, don't, you know, could you knock? I, I think he did knock, but he just opened without, you know, waiting for a response, which is also a little off-putting. He knows that she's, you know, a teenage girl, and when, when he knocks, she says, just a minute. You know, it's not like he... He doesn't hear a reply. He hears a reply and apparently ignores it. So, you know, does he, you know, how far does it go? It's, is it that thing? And, and with the principal also, you know, the way he touches Sydney and then he's got the scissors. So it's like, maybe he is, you know, it, I mean, this kind of rant with, oh, I hate your entire generation. That's the kind of thing that you expect to see from a character who turns out to be the killer. So, you know, and then he even puts on, you know, the, the mask briefly. So, you know, it's like, is it really? And then you hear, you know, the knock and it's like, okay, not that, you know, could they be in, in the closet? And that's, you know, and you're thinking, I suppose I shouldn't give a, it's a classic. You probably know, you know, he's going to be in the closet, like in that other one. And he opens and he checks, okay, he's safe. And then 
the killer shows up. You know, it's it's great. I love when the killer shows up where you would never expect. You know, it's like so he was hiding behind the door. You know, he wasn't hiding inside or behind or something. Just, he was just hiding behind the door there. And, you know, the I'm on the front, you know, I'm, I'm on the front uh, porch. And then she goes out, you know, and you're like, no, don't do that. Because you expect if she goes there, it's going to be, you know, and you think he's actually there because he was just outside of Casey's. But then it's like, or, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not long after anyway. But then she goes out there and it's like, he... He wasn't there. And then she goes in and she locks. So she's safe then. And then he was inside. You know, so she literally, she walked right past him when she walked out to the door. And just the, yeah, it's it's so clever to, to just have this, yeah. And... But but yes, they're they are staging their own slasher. They they don't want to be slasher killers so much. They they want to they want a slasher movie to happen. You know, he said it's all one great big movie, only you don't get to pick your own genre. You know, but we're trying. We're trying to pick the the genre of of slasher and there's always a couple of survivors, you know, after the, the slasher killer is apparently completely dead. He attacked someone, but they maybe survived. And yeah. And it's of course commenting on the relationship between media, young people, violence, you know, how violence is presented in in the media, young people committing violence when that wasn't really expected in previous generations, you know, how how the media affects young people, how, how media, you know, copycat killers, that kind of thing. Um, so, so, yeah, and, and I feel like th this could so easily be like, you know, him yelling, you kids get off my lawn, you know, that I, Film Brain points out that a Romero film does something like that, and I like the film myself, but I can kind of see what he means, that it is kind of, you kids get off my lawn. Here, it really doesn't feel like it. It's, you know, I mean, the, the killers straight up say, no, 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 the movies do not make killers. They just make people who are already killers more creative, you know, and that, you know, I'm not going to comment too much on copycat killers, but certainly you could make the case that some violence committed by young people seems very similar to movies that they had watched or games that they played, you know. So it does go in, yeah, in there and say, you know, there's some, you know, and at, at the same time, it's also kind of, you know, it's also talking to the audience, you know, saying, you know, here are some young people committing violence, you know, the, and, and they're even explaining their violence and they're, they're comparing it to media. So it's again, this really ironic, you know, I mean, if, if it was just someone trying to make the case that young people seeing violence in movies might go and copycat, you know, you could write like an essay about it, you know, you could, you know, it could be the subject of a book, but putting it in a movie and having the actual killers who are young people who are obsessing over horror movies and reenacting, you know, and using lines from them, quoting them like they're these little, you know, like, like it's fortune cookie wisdom or something, you know, just, and talking about the the motives of of movie killers and such some say that you know Stu and Billy turn really stupid at the end you know 
they are panicking and there's you know kind of blood loss they they really hadn't been in a situation that was completely out of their control before the very end you know especially the moment that you know first the gun disappears then sydney is gone so it is this thing of you know that wasn't supposed to happen. This this all went according to plan. You know, we we watched all these movies, taken all these notes. This is how it goes. But then suddenly, the the you know the movie isn't going the way they thought it would, and so they they panic. You know, I mean, even earlier, you know, they said, you know, you know, Stu said, you know, I couldn't be the killer, and you know. Yeah, they, they talk about, I couldn't be the killer, he couldn't be the killer, and do you really think that he's the killer? And then suddenly, the two killers are standing, you know, you could, you could argue that it's, it is possible that Billy didn't mean to frame, you know, himself, but he certainly did, you know, if he didn't, he was way too careless. So it's likely that even him going to prison was part of their plan. You know, it seems to completely, you know, even if it's not like, well, he was a suspect, but we, you know, then he went in, you know, the, the cops looked at it, it doesn't seem like it's him. And it's, he's a character, you know, he's not some throwaway, this is a character, you know, which, again, is really subverting, you know, you, you expect it to be Someone who hasn't been humanized or maybe fully seen, you know, your Freddies, your Jasons, you don't think of them as people, you think of them as, un you know, well, Freddy has, clearly has a mind and personality, but there's nothing about it that suggests that, you know, I mean, you know, there is the, the thing of, you know, well, maybe it was, you know, product of, like, the environment or some kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if nothing else, the way we see him now, you know, maybe sometime in the past, but the way we see him now, when he's on screen, when he's being talked about, he is terrifying. You know, except in a bunch of the sequels. But, yeah, the the... For it to actually be a character, and that's also somewhat where the, the whole whodunit aspect comes in. Because in a whodunit, you know, the the killer the killer is someone that you already think of as a character. That's, you know, part of the, the fun of a whodunit is like, well, whodunit. And, yeah, it's... They, they, they really were expecting the whole thing to work out the way that they wanted it because nothing up until that point has really completely gone against you know the you know when they've gone up against someone and tried to kill them they have usually succeeded and that's of course where you know well is you know did they always mean to did they mean to kill Sydney before you know and that's you know technically it would you know, it, it, you know, either they changed their minds and, you know, on killing her and instead wanted to show her the plan, or maybe it just worked out that way, you know, instead of walking down the sta stairs wearing ghost face or instead of, you know, coming up to her wearing ghost face, Billy and then Stu actually revealed who they are and then instead of just killing her there on the spot, they actually, you know, or they, you know, Maybe they never meant to kill her. Maybe she turned out to be too difficult to kill, and then they changed their mind. You know, but there are options. You know, and and I would say that you know some of the sightings where you know no one really gets hurt. You know, the the bathroom, the the guy you see in you know running around on the you know is it you know near someone's house at least, and the the person that you see reflected inside the store, you know, I, I tend to think that those were probably pranks, but also it's possible that it is just, you know, the movie 
you know, suddenly the killer is in this, because that happens, that happens in slashers all the time. Suddenly the killer is in a place where he couldn't possibly have gone to in that time. And, you know, it's part of the, you know, oh, so you didn't, you bet you didn't expect to see him here. And here does it, and then, you know, then maybe it doesn't lead to anyone dying. Or so, You know, it's, the, again, like when he's right inside of, you know, Sydney's, you know, right inside, and then he tells her that he's on the patio porch, something like that, you know. And I suppose that more or less covers that, you know. Obviously, if it really is the killer those times, then, you know, those times it didn't quite work out. They didn't quite get, but the, the very end is the first time they're really in trouble. You know, the, you know, she calls the police, supposedly. You know, they obviously, they show up way too late, but that's, yeah, well, not quite, not too late for Dewey, but anyway. That's, that's another, you know, that's not even purely a horror trope. That's just like a modern film trope. You know, help gets there too far, especially if it's not a character. If it's not an established character, then help will get there when everything has been, you know, when everything has ended anyway. But, yeah, the... It's, it's when they're really in trouble, you know, the... They've given away their identities, and they, you know, yeah, the, the whole plan, you know, suddenly, you know, not only is Sid gone, but so is her father. So it's like, well, this we were supposed to frame it on this guy, and now he's gone. And, you know, part of the thing with, you know, one killer has a motive, one doesn't, you know, really seem to, or we don't know what the motive is. You know, the the producers and Kevin Williamson kind of, you know, they were like going back and forth. Should he have a motive? Shouldn't he? And so with two killers, you know, have your cake and eat it too. So they don't have to pick at all. I love the the TV being, well, I suppose, okay, this is maybe the most creative kill, you know, of, of the film. If you count the, the two kills that Sid accomplishes, but... Yeah, when when she knocks over the TV onto Stu's face, media violence literally hits back, smacks him in the face, kills him. You know, it's this conversation of, but you know, can can staged violence lead to real violence? Here it could. You know, he got killed by Halloween the movie. You know, and just yeah, that's it's so good. And again, I completely understand some people think that is too thick. And, the, you know, the reason Dewey survived was that test audiences really liked him and wanted him. And I'm so glad that he survived. I He's one of my favorite characters in Scream. And, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm not going to go more into it here. But, you know, in upcoming videos on these films. The opening scene, you know, nobody expected Drew Barrymore to die. She was the most famous, at least of the young people. I don't know if she was more or less famous than Henry Winkler, but yeah, you know, nobody expected it, which is again like another horror movie that is quite renowned, you know, for good reason. You know, I, I re-watched Welshie's excellent retrospective on Scream, and he points out that it peaks the film, you know, too soon. The, the movie never gets to be quite that, you know, tense and, you know, terrifying again. And that is true, but, you know, the whole film is great, the, which I'm not saying that he's not saying that, but... It's, it's, yeah, it's a really insane, it's also, it's the kind of thing that would end other horror movies. I, I, I want to say that apparently it actually also did at one point, there's, like, there's another movie that ends with this scene, but, yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing that you really don't think is going to happen that early on, not with that much detail.
you know, again, you know, the, the opening kill from horror movies, it does tend to be just, well, someone's got to die, let's get it over. I mean, some do manage to make it interesting, but it just, it's, it's, nobody expects the character to go on living for a really long time. Everybody thinks that this is, this is the opening kill. We're just waiting for that person to die. You know, the, the rest of the movie is going to be us guessing when and how someone's going to die. But the very first scene, there's going to be at least one character and they're going to die. So the moment that there's only one character in the opening, it's like, Oh, okay, obviously they're gonna die, so, but, yeah, it's, it's completely unexpected, and really, and I don't think this is really a spoiler, it's where the best ghost face dialogue of the entire series is, primarily in that first scene, but really also in this film in general, and that again, it had to be the first scene for that to happen, because when you first hear it, yeah, you know, at first, it's just, it's a little strange, you know, this guy keeps calling her, but, you know, it seems fine, you know, he just, he just wants to talk to her or something, you know, and, and at first, she's like, yeah, sure, you know, she's, she's not in a hurry to get somewhere, you know, as long as she can watch the popcorn while, you know, she's, Getting ready to watch the scary movie, you know, just some scary movie. But gradually, you know, it's it's been noted that it's like the you know the scene itself is mirrored in the the popcorn. You know, it it starts out fine and gets to a really boiling point and gets completely out of control near the end. But yeah, it's yeah, it's it's amazing scene and so many so great lines. Also because when you just first hear the voice, you know, it's not like this really obviously like over the top evil. Like when he gets insistent, he starts sounding evil. And then uh, of course when he uses you know, when he says things like, do you want to die tonight, Sydney? Your mother didn't, you know, obviously, okay, he's evil. But when you first hear it, it just sounds, you know, like he's a little lonely. He just wants to talk. He wants to talk about scary movies. He loves scary movies. But then gradually it becomes this just, yeah. And the, I should briefly going to, you know, I, you know, those, yeah, if you're watching this movie, this video, you either already know or don't really care, so, yeah, when, when I recorded, so, so, yeah, you know that Drew Barrymore isn't one of the, the leads, even though she was presented to be, so, you know, just for anyone wondering, yeah, that is why in the, you know, the review, I present it as if she is one of the leads, along with Sid and such. And, you know, I mean, I don't think I have to necessarily tell the truth about everything in, in these videos. I'm, I'm talking about movies. I'm not talking about something where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'd rather not, you know, say something untrue, unless it's like satire, but about something, you know, really important and serious. But the movie and the, you know, the the press, you know, stuff and everything, they made it appear to, you know, she's, she's right there on the cover along with the actual main cast, so everybody thought that she was. And if you watch it today and you haven't watched it before and you haven't heard that Drew Barrymore dies in the first scene, 12 minutes in, or, well, you know, it lasts the first 12 minutes, the entire scene, then you don't know, then then you fall for it as well, and I would hate to ruin that in, in my review, so, you know, it wasn't to be super clever or something, but just, yeah, keeping the secret, and the, 
I suppose that is more or less. But but yeah, just everything, every line spoken by Ghostface in this, you know, I I love and I love that it doesn't get overused and it it's never cheap, you know, and it really again, you know, the moment that you know when when she first when when Sydney first talks to Ghostface, you know, she thinks it's Randy doing a voice. She doesn't think that it's actually the killer. You know, once she realizes that it's the killer, from then on out, you know, nobody nobody's called and thinks it's not the killer. You know, so again, you know, the the whole movie has to, you know, 12 minutes in, less than 12 minutes in, the audience not only knows that there is a killer, but we've seen characters survive who also know. You know, even if, you know, com completely independent of whatever happens to Sydney that night, you know, she only learns the day after because everybody has found out and she, you know, she didn't hear it yet. But, yeah, then, then she learns that, that she, you know, that there is a killer and that yeah now i suppose that's more or less but but yeah the every exchange with ghostface on the phone and yeah and and it's this you know them playing the game because they're so obsessed with horror movies and really every young people young character in this person in the every young character in this film you know is obsessed with movies because we kind of are you know you know my generation their generation if it's separate you know 86 um you know is when I'm from so yeah it's we're, we're constantly talking about movies and such and yeah, it's it's this thing of, you know, of these young people, which could it be that's, you know, playing with, you know, playing movie trivia with these, you know, with, with the other young people. And really, you know, you know, Randy himself, yeah, I'm, I admit it, I'd be the first suspect, you know, but we, we never... It's it's not especially you know they don't really tip their hand. They, it doesn't seem like Stu and Billy talk especially much about you know horror films. So you know certainly one of the first characters to talk about horror movies in the film is Billy. And you know regardless of whether it's him or Stu on the phone with Casey, you know the moment he gets into Sid's room, he's like talking about you know or rather once the the father has yeah i think but yeah he mentions the exorcist and yeah so it's it it the, there is that that hint but all of them talk about movies so yeah they there's you don't necessarily you know, single out. Well, the two of them are constantly obsessed with the so. But that again, you know, it's all about media, media, young people, and violence. How them, how they affect each other, and yeah, the movie is basically, you know, patting on the head and saying, "You're, you got it. You, you're right." excuse me, any, excuse me, concerned parent or, you know, really political critic who, you know, tries to tell the world, if young people keep watching violent movies, they are going to, you know, go nuts and, you know, they, they're going to obsess over them, they're going to go nuts and kill people. And the movie's saying, yeah, sure. <laughs> so... Yeah, you know, again, it's it's not seriously saying that when when you see 
Stu and Billy, and they're like stabbing each other, and the whole, you know, part of it is, you know, the, okay, these are, you know, clearly freaking psychopaths, but it's also just this, these people don't, you know, either they're extremely rare or they don't actually exist. You know, people who, you know, they, they legitimately cannot tell the difference between reality and fiction and they want to recreate fiction in reality and this kind of, you know, there are people who can who have trouble distinguishing and there are people who are dangerous and there are even people who are dangerous who do have trouble distinguishing but they're an extreme rarity and it is just yeah you know it, the 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 last scene is almost laughing at them you know from from when the the gun goes missing it's it's like you know the, these are the you know you were scared of these guys remember the you know they're they're yeah it's it's you know or against some will start laughing at them the moment that they start stabbing each other you know it's yeah it's it's you know very very black comedy but yeah these these are not you know I I know that personally I I'm not really going to make a statement. I, I know that some people, you know, really get into the, the horror, you know, the slasher killer character and really, you know, want to see them kill. And, you know, I I can enjoy that myself. You know, Friday the 13th, 3 and 6, yeah, they're quite enjoyable from that standpoint. But, you know, these these two are maybe killers that, you know, it's... These are the two that watch Jason and think, oh, I want to be like him, but they're really not. You know, they, they have none of this kind of, you know, I mean, you've seen throughout the movie, they, they're constantly getting knocked over and slowed down. And, yeah, then they're at the end, you know, they're, they're you know, messing around. The, you know, Sid is, you know, running laps around them, you know, she's... They're they're completely they're 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 a joke. They're at the end, you know. Stu, you know, worried more worried about his parents than you know. And and Billy runs over and you know tears up the the you know the couch as if she would be there. You know, the, yeah. All all of it is just yeah. Now you know the in in that opening you know somehow you know the the I, I should briefly mention that when Sid kills Stu you know he also you know try he tries to kill her and she bites him on the hand making it you know I, I have to imagine that that shot was directed by James Cameron but yeah, in that opening scene, you know, it's, you know, some have commented on why does she get it wrong? Why does she think that it was Jason, not Mrs. Voorhees? Part of it, you know, she even says, you tricked me. It's, he doesn't say the original movie. He says, who was the killer in Friday the 13th? When you say that, it's like when you say Star Wars or Star Trek. Well, which do, do you mean? The original, you know, the original Star Trek series, the original Star Wars movie, or are you talking about the franchise? And yeah, you know, he was referring to the first movie, and she maybe thought the franchise. You know, she does then say, you know, she watched that movie. You know, I don't know. I it could still be that she thinks it's franchise that he's talking about, or it could be one of the other films in the series. I don't know. I really like how this uses swearing. I have no problem with language. Well, you know, I I just recently went to watch The Hateful Eight. Before that, I mainlined Quentin Tarantino. You know, just the days leading up to it. There's a lot of hateful language in there, and you know, I 
I, I can appreciate that it's it you know it certainly is hateful and I, like I said in the, the hateful late video or maybe I added an annotation I would have a problem with it if he was glorifying it but you know the people in Quentin Tarantino movies tend to be the bad guys you know he likes to focus on the bad guys so yeah that is how they talk that is how they act they do and say awful awful things but anyway so yeah, you know, it's not like I need to sit down and watch, like, you know, a, a cartoon afterwards. Although I, I will say, when I was, like, a teenager and me and my friend would watch horror movies, you know, if it, like, super got to us, we would put on a Disney movie, and it kind of helped. So I suppose that is, you know, I, I guess at this point I'm kind of, you know, too detached and, you know, just, it, it, it takes a lot to, you know, I, I can be scared and such by the, you know, if you do it properly, the horror movie or horror game, but it does take an awful lot to really, like, really get in, you know, under my skin for a prolonged period of time, you know. The, the you know, Sinister is one of the only recent, more or less, anyway, yeah, you know, I was still fine after that language, but here the the swearing is used for like, you know, when someone emphasizes something or, you know, when they're trying to, you know, when they are like really angry or when they're trying to seem really tough or the like, you know, it's it's not just casually dropped everywhere. And, you know, it's maybe, you know, in, in the mid to late 90s, you know, characters didn't necessarily swear constantly in mainstream movies. You know, it's today, it's maybe more. But, you know, it here, yeah, it's, it's always for emphasis or some kind of, yeah, you know, when, when, when the killer threatens to gut someone like a fish or, you know, they, they use these really, you know, I, I mentioned the, review there's almost no gore the the language does describe a lot of gore you know does there, there are a lot of different ways of saying I was almost killed brutally with a knife or you know they afterwards they they played around with you know stuff like that but you know that and then the 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 actual swearing is yeah you know it's it's for the occasional one liner it's when someone really tries to just yeah you know there so it has an effect you know and which I'm not saying you know Quentin Tarantino can make swearing have an effect even when there's a lot of it so I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.